Grigory Efimovich Rasputin is possibly one of the most well-known figures of Russian history. A simple peasant that seemed to have belonged to a far distant past, brought into a world of automobiles, cameras and revolutions. A simple peasant that in fact had managed to roast to the top of this modern society and became a symbol of his time. Rasputin led a life of myths and legends that are still echoed to this day. Rasputin was born on the 9th of January, 1869, in the small peasant village of Pakrovskoy. He was the fourth child of Yefim Rasputin and Anna Parshukova. However, he was their first child to actually live past a few months. The young Grigory actually had a very common life growing up, helping his father in many activities, such as fishing, planting crops, and on Sundays he went to church. A pretty common life indeed. Some of his future enemies would say that during his teenage years he was a horse thief. That doesn't seem to be the case. However, it is known that he started drinking at an early age and got imprisoned for two days due to his rude attitude towards the district head of the village. In 1887, when Rasputin completed 18 years old, he married with Praskovaya Dubrovina. They had seven children, of which only three survived, Dmitri, Maria and Varvara. Well, that's it. That's the life of an average Russian peasant. Okay, this is boring. Hey, look, it's the Virgin Mary. Walk, said the Virgin Mary, someday in 1897, turning Rasputin into a pilgrim at the age of 28, or at least that's the story he remembered later in his life. He traveled throughout Russia, visiting monasteries and stuff. It was during this time in Rasputin's life that some people assumed that he got in contact with a Christian sect known as the Klists. What is a Klisti? Well, Klist in Russian means whip, and one can guess by the name alone that they engaged in some brutal practices, while also rejecting usual Christian rites such as marriage, baptism and confession. The Klistis and such other sects considered heretics were prohibited in Imperial Russia at the time. If you want to know more about these sects, you can check out the exclusive video that I posted on my Patreon page, made with the assistance of a friend of mine. You know, YouTube doesn't really like creators who upload once or twice a year, so your support there would help this channel a lot. Okay, back to the video. But was Rasputin really a Klisti? Well, he was investigated in 1907 and then in 1912 about this matter. However, it was not possible to find anything that related Rasputin to the practices of this sect. So he probably wasn't a Klisti. He just had a very unorthodox approach to the Orthodox faith, making it more relatable to his listeners. He continued to wander around preaching and soon he began to gain some popularity, mainly amongst women. He usually laid with them, saying that this was a religious practice or something. Let's leave him doing his things for now. Russia during this time was ruled by the Romanov dynasty. Nicholas II was the current Tsar and his German wife Alexandra was the Tsarina. By 1901 their main worry was on producing a male heir. Until then they had only managed to give birth to four daughters. The royal couple were friends to the Black Crows. No, they were not actually black crows. Rather, they were the Grand Duchesses of Montenegro. They were called like this because they were major fans of occultism. It was through the Grand Duchesses that the royal couple got in touch with a certain Monsieur Philippe, a supposed miracle worker from France. The Emperor and Empress became so close to the man that soon word began to spread that the royal family was under the influence of a crazy Frenchman. So Nicholas decided to send him away. Monsieur Philippe had advised the couple to go into the supposed holy waters of the Sarova River for Alexandra to get pregnant with a boy. No, that's stupid. Can you imagine such a thing happening? Three months later, Alexandra was pregnant. And on 30 July 1904, Alexei was born, the male heir the Romanovs desperately needed. Monsieur Philippe, upon leaving, told the Russian majesties to not worry. Another friend will come and he will protect you when I'm no longer around. No, that's stupid, I guess. I mean, it didn't work out the first time. Where would they find another? 
God damn it. Well, Rasputin finally had arrived in St. Petersburg, the capital of the Russian Empire, after becoming a sensation in Kazan. He went to the capital in search for funds to build a new church in Pokrovskaya, his native village. Soon he became acquainted with the local higher class. A probable interaction between the two would have been like... Have you read Tolstoy? I've seen the movie. And the aristocrats loved it. Of course, Rasputin wasn't really dumb. He had even learned how to read during his pilgrimages. But it was his peasant simplicity that really enchanted a portion of the Russian high society. Like if he possessed a pure Russian soul uncorrupted by the influence of the British and the French. During his time in St. Petersburg, he met Archbishop Theophan, who in turn presented him to the Black Crows, who then presented him to the royal couple. So that's cool. Now the Romanovs have a sort of a spiritual advisor again, and they sure will need one, because it's 1905 and it's revolution time. Well, after Russia began losing a humiliating war against Japan, and a group of peaceful protesters demanding more civil liberties were met with fire by the Russian imperial troops, Worker strikes soon began popping out around the country. Tensions continued to rise even more until Nicholas agreed with some concessions. He signed the October Manifesto, granting the Russians freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, a somewhat freedom of the press, political parties, and the creation of a legislative body called the State Duma. Of course, the royal family was really upset with these measures and would regret them until the end of their life. Well, at least they got Rasputin, who fell into the grace of the Romanovs, simply by saying what they wanted to hear. Basically, that the Tsar is cool and the state Juma sucked. Look, it's Alexei, the heir of the Russian throne. Isn't he a pretty boy? Oops, looks like he just fell. Hold up, see, he's fine. And now, he's bleeding everywhere. Well, as a matter of fact, Alexei had hemophilia, a disease that doesn't allow the body to create blood clots, causing excessive bleeding to the carriers whenever they were damaged, no matter how small the damage. Alexei inherited this disease from his mother, who in turn inherited the disease from her mother Alice, who in turn inherited the disease from her mother Queen Victoria. Rasputin visited Alexei and prayed for the boy's life. And the next day, he was feeling all right. Now, Rasputin wasn't just a spiritual advisor. He also became sort of a healer to the royal family. He continued with his excessive life, traveling around, getting drunk, and going to bathhouses to meet with the hard-working ladies there, if you know what I mean. His wife was still living in Pokrovskaya. She knew about her husband's deviances, but she was chill about it. Theophan, his former friend, on the other hand, wasn't so chill about it, and began accusing Rasputin of spiritual delusion. Theophan went to the Empress and told her that Rasputin was actually evil, but she would hear none of it, believing these stories to be a bunch of nonsense. Rasputin was quickly becoming a protected subject of the royal family. This did not prevent him, however, of being investigated by the Okhrana, the Russian secret police, which would follow his steps for the next years of his life. Then on March 2, 1910, the Moscow Gazette published a lengthy article on Rasputin. Suddenly, overnight, everyone in Russia knew his name, and his war with the press had begun. Nicholas was enraged by this campaign of the printed media stating that Rasputin was a matter of his own personal life. However, he could not do much about it. After the political reforms of 1905, he couldn't just shut down newspapers. Rasputin didn't only have enemies, he also had some friends, like this cool clergyman named Iliodor. Oh no, he's attacking Tsarist officials and the clergy claiming that they were under the influence of the Jews? The Holy Synod, aka the highest administrative body of the Russian Orthodox Church, in response decided to punish him by sending him to a remote monastery. Grigory tried to convince Nicholas to revert this, but to no avail. Rasputin was gathering some scandals, so the royal couple suggested that it should be better if he left for a while. So they decided he should go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Well, meanwhile, Iliodor fled the remote monastery and sent a letter urging Rasputin for help. 
Rasputin was having lots of fun in the Holy Land at the time, so he didn't receive anything. Police was being sent to imprison Iliodor, but at the final hour the Tsar granted him a pardon. Of course, everyone thought that Rasputin had something to do with it, but Iliodor knew he didn't and he felt betrayed by Grigory. And when Rasputin returned, he arranged a meeting with Iliodor. Some other guys were also there. It's not certain what happened next, some stories even mention one of them beating Rasputin's head with a cross in an attempt of forcing him to repent his devilish vices. What does matter is that now Dion's friends and allies of Grigory Rasputin turned into his enemies. Everything now was to blame Rasputin for. Iliodor didn't become Archmandrate. That's because of Rasputin. The Prime Minister and anti-Rasputinist was murdered. Of course Rasputin was behind it. Iliodor even stole some of Rasputin's letter and began spreading that he and the Empress were having an affair. It became a common myth on the subject of Rasputin. They were actually really close, yes, but like friends, just friends, not lovers. Look, it's September 1912 and the royal family is at their hunting lodge in Spala. Alexei was also there. Such a nice family moment. Oh, it seems that Alexei is having some issues with his hemophilia again. The doctor examined the boy and told the Empress the verdict, Alexei will die. And now who can save the fragile heir to the Russian throne? Oh yes, yes, it's Rasputin of course. He wasn't around during the events, so he received a telegram urging him to help by praying for Alexei's life. Rasputin sent a telegram back, saying something like, the kid will live, don't listen to the doctors. So Alexandra took the really rational choice of trusting the weird bearded man. No doctors around anymore. Alexei was to be kept alone. Two days later, the bleeding stopped. Alexei survived. It's a miracle. But was Rasputin really a healer? Well, Rasputin's success may be related to the fact that hemophilia didn't have a proper treatment. The doctor's constant examinations of the boy probably worsened the bleeding, since it was preventing even more the creation of blood clots. Also, it didn't help that the doctors used aspirin, a blood thinning substance, as the form of treatment. So, in this case, the best way of solving the crisis was to trust the weird bearded man and leave Alexei alone. After this event, Rasputin gained even more confidence with the Tsarina. Hey, the Ottomans sucks! Who said that? Oh, it's the Balkan League. They declared war against the Ottoman Empire. That's the first Balkan war. Balkan people working together? I'm sure this will work out. It's part of Rasputin's mythology that he prevented Russia from entering the conflict. And even though he really was a pacifist, he wasn't alone. Other powerful figures, such as the Russian foreign minister, also thought that Russia shouldn't meddle with Balkan affairs. So Russia never entered the conflict anyways. The war ended in May 1913. Okay, I think they are good now. Hey, the Balkans sucks! Who said that? Oh, it's Bulgaria. Less than a month after the first Balkan war, we got a second one. This one was quick but bloody, ending by August 1913. Okay, now I think we can leave them. The press attacks increased and to avoid them, Rasputin decided in June 1914 to leave for Pakrovskaya for a while. After all the scandals and vices of the imperial capital, it's always good to breathe some fresh air from the Siberian countryside. Oh, hello there, noseless woman. Oh my god, she stabbed him! The woman was arrested. Her name was Hionia Guzeva. She was a fanatical follower of Iliodor. Investigations later concluded on 12 October 1914 that Iliodor was in fact responsible for convincing Guzeva to kill Rasputin. However, before he could be brought to justice, he left for Norway. Rasputin's situation was deemed critical by the doctors. Some newspapers were already printing stories that he died. Hey, Austria-Hungary sucks! Who said that? Oh, it's a Bosnian Serb nationalist. He shot the heir of the Austro-Hungarian throne. Just regular Balkan stuff, you know. Nothing to worry about, right? Wrong, that's World War I. Rasputin, still recovering, tried to prevent Nicholas from entering the conflict, but it was useless. Seeing that peace was not an option anymore, Rasputin committed himself to the cause of victory. A week later, he miraculously recovered and left the hospital for St. Petersburg, now called Petrograd. Nicholas was often away because of the war, leaving Alexandra to rely more and more on Rasputin for guidance. 
The scandals, however, did not stop and some fake stories started to circulate. Like when he got naked at a restaurant, the British diplomat that documented this story wasn't even there during that day. This type of stories only served to spark Alexandra's disbeliefs on the real scandals, making her even closer to Rasputin. Well, let's take a look at how the war is progressing, okay? Oh, it's 1915 and it's going pretty bad for the Russians. In response, Tsar Nicholas II took the very technical decision of relieving the career general Grand Duke Nicholas of his position as commander-in-chief. And in his place he put another Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas himself. And it went just as you probably expected. Russia won World War I and annexed the entirety of Europe. The Russians were the first to reach the moon and nowadays we are obsessed with squatting in this outfit and with drinking vodka. Okay, that's not true. Maybe the last part is, but nonetheless. Nicholas's management of the war was actually a disaster. And people began to blame Russia's defeats on Rasputin, of course. Stating that he and the Empress were German spies influencing the war. And even though they weren't German spies, they did send some advices to Nicholas on the front, like suggestions of names more favorable of Rasputin for higher positions. Some of these advices Nicholas would agree, others he would simply reject. Rasputin's influence on the composition of the government relied solely on suggestions. He did not have any hypnotic control over Nicholas as some of his enemies assumed. And his enemies sure were growing. On 19 November 1916, Vladimir Purishkevich gave the angriest anti-Rasputin speech ever before the Duma. A young aristocrat by the name of Felix Yusupov heard it all and soon arranged a meeting with Purishkevich. Together they had decided that words alone couldn't defeat Rasputin, he had to be killed. Other men also joined the plot. Lieutenant Sergei Sukatin, the cousin of the Tsar Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, and last but not least, Yusupov's leader physician Lezoviert. What happened next remains to the realm of speculations, since the main source is Yusupov's memoirs, a highly unreliable source. The day is 16 of December 1916. Felix Yusupov invited Rasputin to his home, stating that his wife would also be there. Yusupov was using his wife as a bait, you know, just to be sure that Rasputin wouldn't decline the invitation. In fact, she wasn't even in the city during that day. At Yusupov's palace, the crew grabbed a poison and put it on the cake and in the wine that would be served to Rasputin. The young aristocrat left to pick up the prey. Rasputin had no idea of the whole arrangement. Arriving at Yusupov's, he was offered the poisoned cake. He ate it all. But nothing happened. Don't worry, there is still the wine. Oh, nothing happened again. Until Yusupov simply shot Rasputin. Okay, he's dead at last. Meanwhile, Sukatin, disguised as Grigory, went back to Rasputin's apartment, alongside Dmitri and Lazoviert, just to appear to anyone following them that they brought Rasputin back to his place after the party. Yusupov decided to check if the man was still alive. Okay, he's not. Oh, never mind, he's still alive, and now he's holding Felix by the neck. Our hero, however, with his natural super strength, managed to free himself and ran upstairs calling for Purishkevich's help. Together they went downstairs to finish the job. Oh no, the beast is not here anymore. He must be far away by now. Oh, never mind. Okay, now he's gone for good, right? Well, Rasputin's body was wrapped into a piece of linen and according to Yusupov, he was still alive. They then threw him into the icy Malaya Nevka river. Now he's gone for good. That's it, our heroes just saved Russia from the bad bearded guy. Now everything would change for the better. Russia won World War I and annexed the entirety of Europe. The Russians were the first to reach the moon and no, again. None of this happened. Soon enough, the body was found on the frozen river. The Empress was furious and demanded to Nicholas that Yusupov and his crew must be hanged. How did Alexandra know who the assassins were? Well, Purishkevich couldn't stop babbling about the deed. Neither Purishkevich nor Lieutenant Sukotin nor Lezoviert were punished at all. Dmitry, the cousin of the Tsar, on the other hand, was sent to the Persian front. And Yusupov in particular had the awful punishment of being confined in his large estate. 
poor thing. Later, an autopsy was made revealing that Rasputin's body did not contain neither poison in his blood nor water in his lungs. But how is that even possible if Rasputin had eaten the poisoned cake and drunk the poisoned wine? Well, Lazoviert confessed later that he had a change of heart and substituted the poison with the harmless substance, without anyone knowing. And what about Rasputin's body not having water in his lungs? Well, that's a proof that he wasn't alive when they threw his body into the river. Yusupov's memoirs are so unreliable that it's not entirely certain if he was the one who wrote it. Purishkevichis' are not good either, being described by a recent Rasputin biographer as filled with empty phraseology and demagoguery. Rasputin's murderers believed that they had saved the Russian monarchy. However, it wouldn't last. By February 1917, the Romanovs were forced to abdicate, and soon after, the Bolsheviks seized power. So, was this medieval-like peasant really the cause of the downfall of the Russian monarchy? Well, of course not. Actually, Rasputin wasn't a figure from a bygone age brought into the modern world. Having a life covered by the media, filled by conspiracy theories and gossips, really makes Rasputin a figure of his time. A time characterized by rapid innovation and science promised to bring progress to mankind. In contrast, some aristocratic groups were averse to this new mechanical and industrial-based society. They searched for answers in Russia's rich spiritual past, with many finding what they were seeking in some heretical sects from the Russian countryside, while others were drawn to the charismatic figure of the simple peasant, uninfluenced by the new world order. Was Rasputin a saint? No, very far from being one, actually. Rasputin was a complex figure who emerged during the rise of mass media, so a lot of myth is mixed with reality on the telling of his life. I highly recommend you checking out Douglas Smith's biography of Rasputin, the main source of this video. Thank you for watching and thanks to my Patreon supporters who made this video possible. A special thanks to Stilidan32, Buratu, and a huge special thanks to Romulus Rancid. Also, don't you forget to subscribe for more videos.